Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by NCSL. All lines have been placed in a listen-only mode to provide favorable sound quality during today's presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Abby Grill. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Hi everyone. My name is Abby Gruel. I am the Policy Director of uh, Human Services uh, for State and Federal Affairs here in D.C. And we're happy to have you on today's webinar. Uh, just a reminder that this presentation will be available to download during the webinar. It can be accessed via the media library, which is the play button in the upper right-hand corner next to the telephone. And this webinar will be archived within a week of the, today's webinar. And you can go to ncsl.org slash webinars to access all webinar archives. You can ask a question at any time by entering, into the, entering the question into the box located on the lower left-hand side of the screen. And after our presenters finish their slides, I'll kick it off with a few questions. And then we'll take questions from those listening in. And if you have any questions about this presentation or other NCSL-related policies or events, you can find my email on our website. Uh, and our presenters today are Morna and Ann from the House Ways and Means Committee, and Ryan and Laura from the Senate Finance Committee, and they'll give their introductions here in a moment. They have worked ex extensively on these issues and will give you some background on the bill and talk about what you should know in terms of funding, standards, and implementation. And thank you all for taking the time to brief us today. For a little background, the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018 was signed into law on Friday, February 9th. The new law includes the Family First Prevention Services Act, which reforms the federal, chi federal child welfare financing stream, specifically Title IV-E and Title IV-B of the Social Security Act, to provide services to families who are at risk of entering the child welfare system. The bill puts the focus on prevention by allowing federal reimbursement for mental health services, substance use treatment, and in-home parenting skill training. It also limits federal funds for putting foster youth into concrete care placements, including group homes, and includes several other child welfare-related updates to federal policy. With that, I'll turn it over to our presenters. Sorry. Okay. So uh, this is Ann Tessero. I'm um, the Majority Staff Director for the Human Resources Subcommittee on Ways and Means. Um, I represent Chairman Brady um, and many of our members on the Committee on Ways and Means who were um, very supportive of, um, of moving this bill through the House and ultimately to final passage. Um, they believe strongly in families and providing real help to them, which means providing evidence-based services. Um, uh, this has been a long and winding road, and our members remained committed to it. Um, even last year, we moved uh, a handful of bills to continue to show our um, commitment to these bills. I'll let the other, um, uh, my colleagues, introduce themselves now. I'm Morna Miller. I'm the Minority Staff Director for the Subcommittee on Human Resources at Ways and Means. So Anne and I work together on child welfare a lot. And, um, and I, my, ranking, my full committee ranking member is Congressman Neal of Massachusetts, and our subcommittee ranking member is Congressman Danny Davis of Illinois. And, um, and I think our members were very united on this bill and are really excited about the opportunity to, uh, to transform the child welfare system in a way that is good for families and good for kids. And we are I'm excited to get to talk to all of you because we know that state, state legislators are going to play an incredibly key role in making this law a success because this is, it's, you know, it's uncapped entitlement funding, but it's matching funding. And so obviously the states will need to put up a contribution and we know that state legislators make those decisions. And so we are excited to tell you about the opportunity for your states. Good afternoon, everyone, or morning, depending on where you're calling from, I guess. Uh, my name is Ryan Martin. I'm the Senior Human Service Advisor for the Senate Committee Finance Chairman, Orrin Hatch. Um, really glad to be able to, to talk with you, knowing that so much of this work will be done in the legislature in terms of adapting the child welfare system to focus on prevention. Um, and we're excited to give states a lot more options to help kids stay with families, um, and especially dealing with the opioid crisis to be able to provide more services to those families so the kids don't need to come into foster care. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Laura Bernson, and I am um, Minority Human Services Advisor to the Senate Finance Committee, um, and my boss is Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon. Um, I think one of the reasons it's so exciting to talk to this audience is um, you all have an ability to influence state decisions, um, and we think it's really important that there are state-level advocates pushing for some of these changes. One of the, one of the things that is um, a feature of this bill is, as Morna mentioned, it's a matching fund structure, but particularly on the prevention side, if a state does not choose to create a prevention, a foster care prevention system, you know, there's nothing in the bill requiring it. So it really is going to take effort on the part of states, um, state legislatures and governors to actually, you know, make this bill realize its potential. And, um, you know, speaking for Senator Wyden, one of the things that really drove him in this space was just seeing, you know, frequent headlines around what is happening to children in this child welfare system, what is happening to families who are having their children taken away, what's happening to foster parents who, you know, are struggling to navigate the social services systems. And driving his interest in all of this was, uh, you know, a belief that we can do better for these kids and doing better for them and doing better for their families means doing more than just foster care. Um, so with that, we can move to the next slide. Great, so Anne's going to kick off our presentation. Oh, so I was on mute. Sorry, I was being really good with the mute button. Um, too good. So um, throughout this presentation, we'll walk you through kind of, you know, the reasons for doing this and kind of the opportunities that exist for you um, going forward. This is really meant to cause change in the system. Um, and so um, you'll probably have more questions, um, and most of which um, will be about implementation. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll do our best to answer them for you, and hopefully we'll address most of them with this presentation. So really, what is the, why did we do this? Um, and as I mentioned, you know, our members are really interested in and what can we do to help preserve those families? How can we um, keep them together? We often heard from foster youth or former foster youth who said, why didn't you help my mom? Why didn't you help my dad? Um, and so for that reason, you know, trying to provide those services to families um, was really one of the motivating factors. Also, as um, I don't need to tell any of you, um, the uh, the growth in opioids and substance abuse issues. Um, it's a growing cause for children coming into the foster care system. Um, that was certainly a motivator, um, but not the only one, but definitely um, a big part of it. Um, and so we hope that this bill will provide um, some of those continuing resources um, as your states try to, try to battle this uh, enormous challenge. So continuing on some of the other reasons for uh, reforming the system. So one, uh, a major focus of this and a number of other social reforms recently has been to get incentives right. So right now the federal government provides partial reimbursement for some costs of the child welfare system. States right now bear more than half themselves. Um, but the federal government uh, offers reimbursement for certain things. One of those was foster care. And unfortunately until now none of that was for any prevention services. And so there's been a long line of individuals advocating and interested in providing uh, 4E, which is a section of the Social Security Act uh, for foster care, uh, entitlement funding for prevention services, so sort of open-ended um, funding that's available to states. And there was a, an interest in doing that, but finding a way to do it that was based on um, you know, doing what works, focusing on things that are going to get real results, uh, and doing it in a way using evidence. Um, so the last provision here on this slide obviously is the same thing, which is making sure that the money that is coming into the Treasury that then is spent back and sent to states is focused on things that are delivering a, an outcome and helping those who are struggling. And so this is not just a theme in this legislation, but one that you'll see broader in social services legislation to shift away from the sort of process measures and more toward an outcome focus. So I won't go into this full timeline, but just um, wanted to flag for everybody sort of the genesis of how this bill came to be a law and encourage you to the extent you want to hear the 
viewpoints of those that contributed to the thinking of senators and members of the House in drafting this bill. Um, we had hearings on congregate care. We had hearings on prevention services. Um, there was a discussion draft that brought together those two themes. Uh, the House had a hearing <clears throat> on the opioid epidemic and its impacts on the child welfare system. The Senate had a similar hearing in 2016. And then the bill was introduced soon after those that series of hearings um, in 2016, reintroduced in 2017, um, and then enacted into law in 2018. But to the extent anybody wants to sort of dig into the um, specific testimony that was heard in all of those hearings, both the Senate and Finance, Senate Finance and House Ways and Means Committee websites have archives of those videos and testimony. I just want to add too that on the House side, we went through regular order, which means. Um, we not only had hearings, we also had a markup, which included a vigorous debate by our members, um, which is also available. Um, and it includes a committee report, that um, a bipartisan committee report, that provides additional detail on each of the policies and sort of justifications. Um, so there's quite a, a legislative history available. Yeah. Um, next slide. Next slide. There we go. Um, so Title I of the bill, so the bill is sort of known for two things, the prevention services title and the um, congregate care reform. The Title I prevention services, in a nutshell, um, so what you can be prepared for having available is beginning in fiscal year 2020, Title IV-E, uh, which is Title IV-E of the Social Security Act, which are the dollars that the federal government pays for foster care. Um, it's an uncapped entitlement funding stream. Those same dollars would be available for up to 12 months for services um, for families where a child is at imminent risk of entering foster care and who without those services would be likely to enter foster care. Um, that's the main eligible population, so the services could go to the child themselves, the family members, or potential kinship caregivers of the child if the child temporarily goes to live with kin. Um, another population that would be eligible is children and youth in the foster care system who are already in the system but who are pregnant or parenting. Um, they would be eligible um, without regard to income test. Um, so one thing worth noting is the foster care system right now used to be connected to the old welfare system. And so states can only receive a match on behalf of children that were removed from very poor families. Um, this bill moving forward provides reimbursement for all of those families for the prevention services as well as pregnant and parenting foster youth. Um, and the bill doesn't uh, have a strict definition of what those services would include, but they would fall in three major buckets, which are mental health services, substance abuse services, and in-home skill-based programs. So for those of you familiar with sort of the home visiting McV models, many of those would likely be um, potentially eligible, but, but these are services that are delivered to a family in their own home. So the, the major, as we have mentioned a couple of times, that the funding here is, you know, is uncapped and potentially unlimited, but it does have some limitations, and one of the key limitations is that, um, that in order to be funded, the services would need to meet an evidence standard. And, uh, and so there are there's sort of three kinds of evidence that are defined in the bill. There are, there are interventions that are considered promising, so that means they had at least one study that used some form of a control group. Uh, there are interventions that are considered to be supported, and that means they had at least one study that used either a random control design or a quasi-experimental design, and, uh, and they found an, an effect that lasted at least six months. And then the um, and then the third category, and this is the sort of important one to know about, is that interventions that are considered well supported are actually interventions where there were at least two studies that used a quasi-experimental design or a random control, and they found they were carried out in an, in a in a usual care practice setting, and at least one of the studies found a sustained effect for at least a year, and so critic. One thing that's critically important is that 
when states submit for reimbursement of these new prevention services, 50% of the services that they submit of the spending will need to be spent on well-supported interventions. So, um, so it'll be so one really important thing for states that are looking to maximize their prevention funding is to identify some well-supported interventions that they want to fund and make sure that those interventions constitute half of the spending. Next slide. So, so what you're probably most interested in is what uh, the federal contribution is going to be. So for the first period when this money starts flowing on federal fiscal year 2020, which is October 1, 2019, which is next fall, um, will be the federal contribution will be 50% for those services. Um, and then um, towards the end of the period, which because we work in 10-year periods, in 2027 it will move to FMAP, um, which will be um, more similar to how you operate other programs um, and more consistent with how we, we fund child welfare. Um, then there's also money within this bill for training and administration um, consistent with current law levels and the other part of uh, child welfare at 50%, and that is um, in perpetuity starting in 2020. Um, there's also a, a federal match of 50% for the Kinship Navigator Services. And then there's a one-time slug of money in um, federal fiscal year 2018 of $8 million for foster parent recruitment and retention. Um, that's an area where we, um, we kind of left it open to HHS, but look forward to hearing more about um, the innovative ways that your states are are um, promoting foster parent recruitment and the retention of good foster parents um, because this bill will expect um, a higher uh, level of uh, family foster homes, um, especially in the immediate term, but hopefully over the longer term we'll have less families coming into foster care. So um, one of the components of the bill that we received a number of questions on throughout our drafting process was a requirement that there be a maintenance of effort of current spending on prevention services. Um, so this essentially says, you know, in order for a state to get a reimbursement uh, from the federal government for services, they have to spend above, they get the reimbursement on what they spend above fiscal year 2014 levels. Something that I think is important to note on that is that the maintenance of effort only applies to what states were spending on these evidence-based prevention services for this specific population. So if your states aren't running this type of system right now, which most states are not, um, the, the MOE would essentially be very low. So if you have a robust, you know, home visiting program that is going to all, you know, 20% of moms, um, but there's not that children at imminent risk of entering into foster care criteria, et cetera. It's not as though all spending on home visiting would have to be um, above 2014 levels. This is just for this narrow subset of prevention services for families and candidates for foster care. Um, <clears throat> Another thing we've gotten several questions about is many jurisdictions right now, I believe 30 or so, are running their Title IV-E systems under a waiver, um, and the waivers vary in size, depend, size and scope depending on the population served and the um, activities that states want to do under these waivers. The waiver authority expires at the end of fiscal year 2019, and the prevention services authority begins at the beginning of 2020. So the idea is for states that have waivers that expire before 2019 that those would be extended um, so that there's no cliff uh, between when the waivers expire and when the prevention services option begins. Next slide, please. So the bill is broadly divided into two titles, the first of which we just talked about in terms of the prevention services and the additional funding that's available for kids who are at risk of coming to foster care. Now the second section has to do with the federal financing of placements when children are not with families or in other settings, but when they're in a congregate care or group homes. And so the current law already specifies that children have a right to be placed in the least restrictive setting. And we know through a number of studies and personal experience you're hearing from from youth and others that 
children do much better when they're in a family setting um, than in the group home, except for in certain instances. And so when a child can't be placed in a family-like setting, um, there's strong congressional support um, and strong outside support from you know, hundreds of groups who spoke in support of the legislation that children should be with a family whenever possible. And if they are in a group home, it should be to receive treatment and therapy that they need so they can hopefully uh, live with the family after that. Um, so this legislation added new standards for placements other than foster family homes. So uh, after a two-week grace period, the Family First law would limit this 4E, again, foster care payments to only a certain group of settings. Uh, one is obviously family foster homes, and relatives are included as well as they are now. Um, the other would be a placement for pregnant or parenting youth. So any setting that um, is working with those youth would be continue to be eligible. Um, number three, any supervised independent living situation for youth over 18. Uh, I'm going to skip number four and go to five and six really quick, and we'll go into four a little bit more. Uh, number five would be specialized settings for victims of sex trafficking or those who are likely to be victims of sex trafficking. And then the last is when a child is placed with a parent in a family-based residential treatment facility. So when you hear about some of the changes that this law made to reimbursement for foster care, the focus on those changes is really on this number four, which is uh, qualified residential treatment programs. And there was some structure added around that in terms of requirements that those facilities would need to meet to receive funding. So one of the so part of the vision of the of the reforms in Title II is that federal law already requires that children in foster care should always be placed in the least restrictive setting, which normally would be a family setting. And over the years, there's been some overuse of the congregate care. And many states have actually already responded and begun reducing their use of congregate care. So, that, uh, so the concept in the bill is that the children who would be placed in congregate care are children with a really high level of need that for some reason can't be accommodated in a family setting. And the, uh, and the intent is that they would be placed in, this, in a new, in a model of congregate care that, that the bill calls a, a QRTP. And, um, and many congregate care facilities are already following this model, that they, they have a trauma-informed treatment model, they facilitate outreach to family members, they provide discharge planning, they're licensed and accredited, and, um, and so and there are other congregate care facilities that may be able to upgrade in order to, to meet these standards, but the, um, but the the thinking is is that if a child has severe enough needs that they can't be placed in a family setting, that they need to be in a facility that could deal with those needs. And the QRTP model is based on the sort of best practices in the kinds of facilities that could meet those needs. Next slide. There are, in addition to the prevention and congregate care provisions in Family First, there are also a number of other provisions in the bill that may be of interest to you. Uh, the, uh, the bill reformed and reauthorized the regional partnership grants, which currently fund a lot of really innovative co collaborative projects in communities to help families that are dealing with the challenges of, of parental substance abuse. And the vision in the bill is that right now the RPG grants are funding both coordination and services to family and direct services to families. And, and they are actually serving as sort of an engine of generating new evidence-based interventions. Our intent is that as Family First comes online, that in many cases the RPGs that are offering evidence-based interventions would then be able to fund the services to the families using the using the new entitlement dollars under Family First, and that would free up more of their grant funding to cover their coordination costs or to cover their, their, evalu their efforts to test innovative new and evaluate innovative new policies. 
The, um, the bill also expanded access to education and training funds for youth aging out of foster care to age 26 to kind of synchronize with our other youth programs. Uh, it included a provision that I know is of interest to, to many of your states about supporting state efforts to link up their, their electronic systems to make it easier to place children across state lines. Um, they also required HHS to promulgate model standards for licensing, family, for licensing family foster homes, and we ask states to either adopt those standards or let us know why those standards don't work for their states. This is partly prompted by concerns about some states where kinship, where kinship caregivers are maybe not being considered as foster parents in situations where they should be or are having difficulty getting licensed when, uh, when the law should allow them to be licensed. We also extended a lot of child welfare programs within our jurisdiction, including for the Promoting Safe and Stable Families program, which prior to Family First was the, the primary source of prevention funding from the federal government for states, uh, but it was a relatively a, a smaller pool of money and also provides funding for adoption services and some other good child welfare work your states do. And finally, as Ryan mentioned, we created that new option for states to fund residential, family residential substance abuse treatment as if it were foster care, but so that if, the, if a child, so right, so right now if a child is in, if a, fam, if a parent is in, in substance abuse treatment and the child is in foster care, the state gets reimbursed for the cost of the maintenance cost of foster care for the child. But if the child is instead in a family substance abuse treatment model, program with their parent, then the state can't get reimbursed. So we made that reimbursable so that states would have that option as well. I think more of this one's YouTube. Oh, right? that one Sorry. Um, we, uh, we also, between the time that we passed the bill in the House and the first time and when the Bipartisan Budget Act was enacted, we got a lot of feedback about, uh, about the bills from, you know, from states and from counties and from stakeholders. And, uh, and we did make some changes to address some concerns or to clarify some things that uh, in, the, in the bills. So, um, and I wanted to, flip, wanted to flag three things that you might have heard about and that were things that I know that there were folks that were concerned about that, have been, that were taken care of. Uh, the first is that in the, in the prevention services title, we, uh, we clarified that if, a child is, that if a child is at imminent risk of foster care and starts receiving prevention services through 4E, while, and is living temporarily with kin while they receive those services, that that will not affect their eligibility, their income eligibility for foster care if it turns out that the child does need to enter foster care at a later point. Uh, advocates sometimes call this the home of removal issue, uh, that because foster care eligibility is based on income, if they were concerned that if a child was temporarily living with a family member with higher income, that it might make them income ineligible for foster care in the future, um, or income in ineligible for federal reimbursement of foster care in the future. Uh, the second thing was that we excluded funding for prevention services and programming from being counted toward the social services spending cap for the territories because the so that if the territories choose to access these funds, they can do it in a real way. And, uh, and finally, there, there is an exception to using 2014 as the MOE base year for, um, for some very small states with fewer than 200,000 children, that, they, um, that in those states they would have the option of comparing to, um, to, to 2015 or 2016 spending instead of 2014 if 2014 happened to be a very high spike year. And then wanted to highlight, we've sort of mentioned these throughout, but wanted to highlight four specific changes to the um, Title II of the bill, so the congregate care changes, um, because there was a lot of discussion around this um, and discussions with uh, group home providers and states and others as well, um, and there were significant changes made to address those concerns, and so we wanted to highlight those. 
Uh, the first one, um, in the original draft of the bill, in the version that passed House originally, there was a requirement that license and other uh, nursing and other licensed clinical staff be on site um, uh, during business hours. And so it was a requirement that staff be available at each of these facilities. We heard a lot of questions and comments and concerns about the um, both the appropriateness of having these staff at every facility and also the difficulty in some cases of having them available during business hours at each residential center. And so this provision was changed so that the staff are in accordance with the child's treatment plan. So if you have a group of high needs children that need specific medical care and oversight, those staff need to be um, available to those youth. In other settings where it may not be as intense, they may not need to be there each day, uh, but they need to be sort of on call as needed um, so that the appropriate people are, are available when the child uh, needs that attention. The second one um, is was mentioned earlier. It's another setting in which these, so we have these new provisions about what a, uh, a facility would need to meet in order to receive federal reimbursement. One of those types of facilities that was exempted from these new requirements, including the staffing and other things, was it allows for federal reimbursement when children are placed in specialized settings for youth who are victims or at risk of becoming victims of sex trafficking. Uh, we heard from a number of states about certain types of um, facilities they have for these youth, and so those were exempted from the new uh, requirements. The third just clarifies that even when a child is placed in a facility that doesn't meet the requirements, and so the state can no longer get reimbursement for the monthly, what they call the maintenance payment, which is sort of the, the monthly payment room and board, I guess, um, that they would still be able to get the administrative costs that the state needs to do the casework for the staffing and things like that to make sure they can still oversee that case. Uh, and the last one is a requirement that states conduct a, or that facilities, I guess, conduct a criminal history background check and child abuse and neglect registry check for staff who work in these group home settings. Um, Long-standing practices has been a requirement of any foster parent or adoptive parent or relative. Um, all states and all facilities have these types of requirements where they're doing these checks. This one just clarifies the types of checks they should be doing, and if there's certain ones that they're not doing, they would explain what they're doing instead. And then two additional changes. Um, one of the things the bill does is it delays the full phase-in of what's known as the adoption assistance program. So when children are <clears throat> adopted out of foster care, the state continues to receive um, a reimbursement for payments that they give to the parents of those adopted children, just as if they were in foster care. In 2008, Congress passed a law saying that um, we would delink those payments from the old welfare eligibility standards, but because that had a pretty high cost, that delink was phased in over 10 years. And one of the conditions of that um, delink was because the federal government was now reimbursing states for something that states were paying 100% of the cost of, states were required to report to HHS on how they were reinvesting their dollars that they had been spending previously on child welfare services. Um, and we heard from GAO and others and states and advocates that to some extent states were not accurately or calculating at all their um, D-Link savings. And so one of the um, justifications for this provision is that the bill pauses that full phase in for the last cohort of very young children. Um, and request that GAO do an investigation to figure out how to better ensure that states are reporting on the savings that they have from that 2008 law. Um, and so this bill, the revised version, extends the window for which there is a delay um, in these repayments, but it also narrows the population of children for whom the state cannot receive a claim. So, in a nutshell, I mean, I think that one of the important things to take away from this is it's not taking any money away from states. It's delaying a match that was going to come online. Um, and then another thing that the uh, latest version of the bill now law has is a optional two-year delay for states in implementation. Um, so if a state says this is too much, we can't handle it, um, there is an option to delay both the prevention services title and the congregate care title for up to two years. Um, 
you can't pick and choose which one to delay. It is neither or both. Certainly we hope that states don't opt to delay um, and that they start drawing down these new funds um, as soon as possible, um, but if they do need to delay, there is that to your option. Next slide. So we know that most of the questions are probably about implementation. We have a lot of questions about implementation too. Um, but um, obviously the Department of Health and Human Services is in charge of implementation and we know that they are working very hard to get to, to get up to speed and to get and to to get this law online and uh, and to have it be successful. We did um, and we so we wanted to stay, you know, definitely Stay tuned and keep an eye out because we hope that HHS will start issuing guidance and, and also asking for input. Uh, but we also wanted to, we've been encouraging states and we would encourage you to encourage your states to not wait for HHS to start thinking right now about what you would like to do with, with this new funding source and, and what you could do to make a difference for kids in your state and, uh, and to really engage proactively with HHS about making sure that the guidance they put out accommodates that. We also, in the recent omnibus appropriations bill, Congress provided some funding that we hope will create sort of a glide path to Family First that, um, that the omnibus appropriation included included new funding to fund kinship navigator programs in um, in every state and in, in every in every territory in FY 2018 kinship navigator programs are the are great programs that provide services to family members that have stepped up to uh, to help care for children in situations where the family is troubled and Starting in 2020, in fiscal year 2020, there will be a 50% federal match available for those services. So we're hoping that these that these limited grant funds for kinship navigator programs will ensure that every state can go ahead and get their program started and get it up and, and running. We also doubled the funding that's available for regional partnership grants in fiscal year 2018. Again, the RPGs have been a real sort of engine of developing the kinds of evidence-based policies that we hope states will fund with Family First. And so the hope was that by increasing funding for RPGs, we could both get more things in the pipeline to be evidence-based and also give states and communities an opportunity to get some infrastructure set up for when the federal funding is available. We'd also really encourage you to take a look at the great thing, the great programs that are operating in your communities right now and to see if they have already been evaluated and might already meet the evidence standard, in which case you want to make sure that HHS has them in the clearinghouse and if they don't have the kind of evidence then to have them get going on evaluations right now so that by the time the mandatory funding is available, those programs would be eligible because we really think there's a great opportunity here and we know that you all will be a really big part of making this a success. Okay, so we will take some questions now. If you have questions, please type it into the box on the left. Um, I will start out um, with a couple. And just um, for your reference, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact myself and Haley, who is our, our health counterpart. Um, so if you all could talk about, I know this is uh, specific, but for cross-state placements, uh, states will be using an electronic interstate case processing system. Can you talk about what states need to know and how much money will be available for this? Sure. Uh, this is Ryan again. So uh, a number of years ago, six states piloted what is called the National Electronic Interstate Case um, Processing System. And the idea, again, was to make it easier to share data between states when a child would be placed with a relative or a foster parent or an adoptive parent in another state. Um, a number of states have come online. This is being administered through um, American Public Human Services Association. They have a, a website that has listings of the sites and somewhat of the agreements look like and things like that. But 
what this bill does is it reserves five million dollars um, starting in 2018 um, and makes it available until 2022 for states to receive funding to sort of tie into the system. And it's not actually a, a system in itself; it's more of a, a bridge or a crosswalk between systems. So what they do is they set up this interchange so that one state system, you know, the name and birth date and address or whatever fields can line up with the other state's information. Um, and they found through studies that it saved about a month and a half of waiting um, for kids to move between the states. So we expect HHS will be, you know, like other guidance, being issuing information about how states can apply to receive that funding um, so that they can tie into that system. Great, thank you. Um, and can you also talk about uh, a little bit more about the qualified residential treatment programs? How long can states use those? And then what are the options for extending that timeline? Sure. So th this is Laura. Um, just like under current law, there is no restriction in terms of how long a child can be in a qualified residential treatment program. The thinking being um, if a child is so high needs that this placement is necessary, um, we did not want to set timelines on that, recognizing that you know each child has a unique case, and these programs are all meant to have therapeutic and treatment components to them. Um, where the timeline restrictions come in are when a child is not in a qualified residential treatment program, a family foster home, um, or one of the alternative placements that was referenced in a previous slide, such as you know specialized placement for trafficking victims or for pregnant and parenting youth. So sort of a helpful way to think about this is um, prior to Family First, um, there is this category called child care institutions, and those were ineligible for replacement. Family First allows that, maintains that current definition of child care institution as an allowable for replacement, um, which is super broad, you know, includes group homes, congregate care, residential treatment, et cetera. Um, but what it does is it creates this new subset within child care institution, which is qualified residential treatment program. And then there's a two-week restriction now on child care institutions. So when a child enters foster care, any placement allowable under current law um, including law prior to Family First, is allowable for up to two weeks with a federal match. And then beyond two weeks, if the child is in a congregate care facility, that facility has to meet the standards of a qualified residential treatment program. Um, if a child is not in a placement like that, um, you know, the state, the states pay for a significant portion of child welfare spending right now. This isn't a prohibition on children being placed in um, other placements. It's just a prohibition on 4E maintenance payments for supporting those placements with federal dollars. Um, and another important thing, and we got into this earlier, is if a child is in, an in, is in an ineligible placement, the state can still draw down um, administrative costs on behalf of those children with the hope being that they would use those administrative dollars to help move them into a 4 e eligible placement. Thank you. And we have gotten a few questions about um, the, the delay that states can apply for. And can you just explain about um, the delay on the reimbursements and the prevention front? So basically, the, the way the delay works is that it's, it's purely a state option. There's no, there's no HHS discussion. The state can decide that, um, that they would like to delay for two years. And if they opt to delay for two years, then that would mean that during that two-year period, they would not be able to receive any 4E reimbursement for, for evidence-based prevention services. And so there would be no matching funds available for prevention services for that state. Um, or for um, or for kinship navigator services, and um, and they would but they would would not have to comply with the new restrictions on um, on congregate care placements during that two year period, and then at the end of that two year period, the congregate care restrictions would apply to that state, and they would be become eligible for the prevention funding. 
And then another thing worth flagging on that, it's a, it's a state option to delay for up to two years. So a state can elect to delay for one year or for six months or for anything under that two-year time frame. It just caps it at most two years. That is very helpful. Thank you. And uh, finally, unless there's other questions, can you just talk about what the government, the federal government will be doing to help states uh, gear up for the implementation? I know there will be technical assistance, and can you um, just mention the clearinghouse as well? So our role, the four of us, um, are pushing on HHS to get you guidance as quickly as possible, um, and um, working with them to get it is to get to you what it is you need to make decisions. We recognize that there is an order to how you need to make decisions, um, knowing what is in the clearinghouse, what isn't, what, how do you move a program into the clearinghouse, all of those sorts of things. Um, and so that is what we've been pushing on HHS to do um, and will continue to do. But as Morna alluded to earlier, you know, don't wait for them to tell you everything before you start thinking about this. Um, take a look at what you're already doing. Take a look at things that you thought that you wanted to do that maybe you couldn't do before. Um, and uh, be ready when that guidance starts to come out because it is a very abbreviated timeline. Others? Yeah, I think we, you know, we just hope that as uh, state officials look at this and what the possibilities are and make sure they inform HHS of things that they're doing that might fit into these categories because they're, you know, they're going to try and be aware of it, obviously of things that are going on, but the more you can sort of point to examples and sort of express interest in certain things, um, you know, there's a lot of flexibility in the law that they'll be sort of looking at and some they'll be regulating on, some they won't, and so it's good for them to hear from everybody. One of, the, one of the questions that we've gotten from some states, too, is that in a lot of states, the kinds of prevention services that you might offer to families are not necessarily administered by the 4E agency, by the Child Welfare Agency. And so, um, and so one thing that some states have, are going to need to do is to get the, their different departments talking to each other. And I know legislators are always very good at getting administrative agencies to talk to each other. So, um, you know, so if there is a different department that is offering a great evidence-based prevention intervention, then they could be the ones to offer that intervention. They're just going to need to work with the 4E agency to make sure that it's in the 4E state plan and that the and the 4E and the reimbursement is going to flow through the 4E agency. Okay, thank you all very much. We really appreciate uh, the briefing today. And this webinar will be available on NCSL's website within the next week. If you have any questions, please feel free to email. And, um, and we'll be sending out additional information as it comes out. Thank you again, and we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This does conclude today's webinar. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time and have a great day.